Okay, let's finish up the, the semester um, with extinction uh, and how we might be able to prevent them, and it's tough. We've had five great extinctions uh, over geological history. Um, some is one as long as four, 450 million years ago. And the most recent one was 65 million years ago. That's called the KT event. That's basically when all the dinosaurs or everything bigger than a bread box were wiped out. Uh, but in each one of these five extinction periods, um, up to 90, 95% of the species on Earth were lost. Uh, and obviously it takes millions of years for the species to come back. So. If somebody says to you, yes, extinction is, is normal, certainly it's happened, but not to the rate, uh, not like it happened those four per five periods, and like what's going on now. So what I want you to know from this is the local and natural, national features of extinction, why we're having such an increase, how fast and where are the extinctions occurring, and how should this guide global conservation. So we've already talked about this in biodiversity, but why should you care about the extinction crisis? And many of you uh, in your homework gave some real good uh, reasons for wanting to preserve biodiversity. But the why we should be concerned about the current extinction crisis is because of the speed. It is so much more rapid than what happens now normally. Now, you remember Aldo Leopold. You've had to read a couple of his writings. And he said the first law of intelligent tinkering is to keep every cog and wheel as the first precaution. Obviously, if you take a watch apart, you don't want to throw away a few gears before you try and put it back together. And all of you know about the importance of, of having many species and many food webs and many food chains in the stability of an ecosystem. And if you start throwing cogs like species out, it's not going to be as stabling, stable. If we look at just an endangered species in the US, and we actually have very few compared to the rest of the world, 67% uh, are secure, 7% are critically imperiled, um, and those are critically endangered, and then 8% are endangered. Uh, I don't want to get into the definitions there, but critically extinct means very, very low, like less than 50 animals. Number of plant and animal species uh, extinct in North America since the arrival of the pilgrims is 500. Number of U.S. species and subspecies currently listed as threatened or endangered is 617. Number of species that have been removed because we've they've been recovered is six. Number removed because they are now extinct, seven. That's not a very good batting average. Plants with improving population, 26. Plants with declining population, 20, 97. Animals with improving populations, 33. Number of animals with declining population, 20, 122. At the current listing rate, it would take um, over 50 years to develop conservation plans for all of these species, and we don't have that time. Here's a breakdown. I'm not going to read it to you on mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. You can see in North America, it's primarily birds, and but really plants uh, are the most. Um, in other countries, it could be amphibians and plants, but plants are are very um, have very high rates of extinction. Uh, in our own state, we have 59 threatened or endangered species from the black-footed ferret, which actually I learned as extinct, to the Colorado pike minnow, uh, which you've done a little bit of reading about. A lot of the problems in our country are financial, so I'm going to go back over some of my notes. Uh, for example, when I did this lecture in 2011, the national budget for endangered species was only 140 million. A lot of that was earmarked for wolves. 
Um, that's less than it cost to make any movie, less than it cost to build one mile of urban highway. Our country has really not gotten together. Now it's gotten worse. Over the past three years, the federal government has invested 210 million in threatened species, which is 70 million each year. So half of what was done in 2011, this is all under the Trump administration. This last year, Trump cut the funding to add wildlife and plants would be cut by 50% to just $11 million per year. And the whole U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which oversees endangered species, cut to 16%. Let's look at pre-anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic means when people were around. So let's look at extinction rates developed by fossils, by looking at fossils. Um, Again, we've had five mass extinction events. Uh, if you're monitoring a million different species, you expect one to go extinct each year. Um, in contrast, based on the rate in which the tropical forest are being reduced, and that's where the major extinction events are occurring, we're now losing 27,000 species per year. Not one per year, 27,000 species per year to extinction on habitats alone. Look at mammals. These are Sonoran pronghorn um, that are found here in Arizona, and this is an endangered subspecies of pronghorn antelope found in the desert. These animals can survive without drinking water, uh, have some incredible adaptations to living in very hot, uh, arid environments. Um, looking at the fossil, fossil record um, of mammals, each species lasts, on average, about a million years. So given that we have 5,000 species, we would lose one every 400 years. Some may more, some less. Uh, in the last 400 years, we've lost 89 extinctions, which is 45 times, 450, 100% times the predicted rate. And another 169 mammals are listed as critically endangered. So you see when I said the speed of extinction is our reason for concern. We're heading into our sixth, we are in our sixth extinction um, period. Now what can relate to a species risk? Um, there are certain factors in the animal's life history. Species that in a way in some, uh, interfere in some ways with people's activities. That picture in the background there is a brown bear. Um, they compete with humans, they, they kill livestock, they kill people, uh, and that's why they're endangered in the lower 48, because they've been shot and trapped and killed. Species like birds that migrate, not only do they need their summer range protected, their winter range protected, but all the areas protected where they stop during migration. It's very difficult to do because it often involves several countries not just states, but several countries. And it's tough to tell people in Central America what to do. Animals that have a very specific food or shelter requirements. Remember way back in the beginning of the semester, we talked about Abert squirrels uh, only dependent on ponderosa pine. So if, if ponderosa pine were gone, we would lose the Abert squirrel. I'm not too worried about that happening, but you never know. Um, some species are very sensitive to temperature changes. Um, if you or you know of someone that has a salt water tank, you know it's very expensive to have a salt water tank in Arizona because those species evolved in an ocean that never changed temperatures. So you can keep a thermometer to keep the water warm in the summer, in the winter, but you have to keep your air conditioner down very low to keep that water about 72, 74 degrees, or those species will die. They, they come from the ocean. They've never evolved the ability to changes in the environment. Species that have very few young, and species that are naturally rare, obviously, are uh, in danger of going extinct. Look at another taxa, the birds. Uh, right now, we have 10,000 bird species. Uh, According to the fossil record, we should have one extinction every 200 years. So Pacific Islands, first human contact about 5,000 years ago. 
some only 2,000 years ago. Hawaii fossil records indicate the first contact was a loss of 70 to 90 species from the original 125 to 145. So one extinction every 200 years, but yet we had 70 to 90 species go extinct in 3,000 years. Here's some better data. Uh, in the last 500 years, we've lost 187 extinct bird species just in the last 500. And we're down to 9,975. If on average a bird species lasts 3 million years, one every 200 years, every 200 years you would expect a bird to go extinct. We're losing bird species every, a bird species every three years. That's a 300 percent increase in the extinction rate. That's imaginably fast. Some things that predict future extinctions other than the natural history characteristics I described earlier. Um, here's with, again we'll stick with birds. Um, most of them were island species, but islands were not the key. The, the key predictors to whether a species goes extinct or not is their range size. And we'll, let me show you what that means. Most species ranges are very small. Look at amphibians. 50% of the 6,000 species of amphibians around the world have a range of about 6,000 kilometers squared. That's, the, that's how much area of the earth those 3,000 species cover. That's one quarter of Maricopa County. One quarter. Of the 5,500 mammals, most mammal species only cover 2,500 kilometers squared, which is about the size of Michigan. If you look at birds, which obviously have larger home ranges because they can fly, most of their home ranges are about the size of Alaska. These are all 50%. Now, this map is somewhat confusing, and I don't want to get you hung up on it, um, but I do want you to know that species with really small home ranges are here in South America. Look at North America. Nada. We don't have species with uh, small home ranges, and we'll get into why here on the next slide. But you can see that the tropics, which I mentioned earlier, which is where most of the extinction is going on, is where you have most of your small species, amphibians, birds, and small range mammals. Now, Europe and North America don't fit that, and that the most original research occurs fits rule one. Now rule one to me is there's an exception to every rule and that includes rule one. So in biology we have no mandates uh, that we can 100% predict something like physics or chemistry does. Uh, there's always going to be exception but North America and Europe are huge. So we don't have these small um, home range species. Most of ours are, are very large. We have a much lower number of species than the tropics. We don't have near as many niches and we have many more generalists which are likely to adapt in temperate climates. Now I would love to be able to say if you figure this out send me an email and I'll give you 10 extra points but then most of you probably wouldn't figure it out if we go back and we look at this map and we look at the history of North America, what happened in North America over the last five million years? We had as many as 22 ice ages. It used to be four, now it's up to 22. So almost all our whole continent would be covered by ice. So our species over the last five million years, Europe and North America and the, North, the Northern Hemisphere, went through global cooling. We have much less number of species. We don't have species with small home ranges. We've had our extinction event. Now that extinction event wasn't the cause of humans, but humans are doing a great job of causing an extinction event in other areas of the world, including the Northern Hemisphere. 
So I hope this explains, gives you a little more information on uh, what's going on. And I hope you are able to, and I'm having trouble turning this off again, and I'm very sorry. Um, boom.